Welcome to our first episode of When Destiny Calls. This is a new podcast series with my friend Christy Foster. Uh, we, uh, I am Dr. Lahab Al Samurai. We will be um, exploring the ideas and thoughts of uh, many great thinkers, um, as well as discussing um, ideas um, that connect to the archetypal structures that move us in the world. So Christy, would you like to introduce yourself, kind of talk about yourself? And Yeah, so hello everyone, I'm Christy Foster. A um, little bit about myself, I, I have been in private practice for quite some time. Most of the work I do is somatic, emotional work, um, looking at people's structure, their body, seeing where uh, one might hold some emotional patterns in their body that they're not aware of and bringing light to that and giving them tools to move through it in a different way. Because a lot of times I've noticed in my practice, people get stuck and it becomes such a blind spot. And then it becomes a painful spot. Literally physical pain starts to happen in the body. And so that's what I do. Kind of mm, putting puzzle pieces together. Putting puzzle pieces together. I like that. So I'm going to start with that. We are, um, we are people who like to solve puzzles. Mm, yes. We like, we like to solve the puzzle of, um, it's a kind of a big puzzle, <laughs> but it's the puzzle of existence. What is existence? How does existence work? Where does it work? Where does it not work? Where do, where do we feel like life is truly inspirational and where life is not truly inspirational. So looking for pieces of a puzzle, I, I'm gonna start today. Um, I'm Dr. Lahab Al Samurai, by the way. I also, like Christy, have a private practice. Um, I am also um, created uh, Young and Advanced Motor Processing that we use for treatment of uh, trauma anxiety, irritation, and other things. And uh, the what I wanted to start out today with is characteristics of the archetype. What are characteristics of an archetype? So let me define an archetype today. And I'm going to ask my friend Christy to kind of uh, tell us about her thoughts in regards to the archetypal patterns. And she has some thoughts that she would like to share with all of you. So um, I'm going to start by talking about the archetype. So the archetype in Western culture and Western literature was discovered by Plato. Um, it comes from the Greek word uh, archotapos. It uh, reflects that it's archetype. And what um, Plato talked about is imaginary figures. He gave the example of people who lived in a cave who had not seen other people or other things. How do they know how to draw the form of people? Because they live in this dark cave. And in this dark cave, you have no light. You can't see anybody else. So how do you know, how do you learn to draw form? How do you understand that? Where does that come from? And that's where he starts to explore the idea um, of the archetype. Now, Jung picked up the idea of the archetype to use it in his psychology to talk about um, what the archetype is, he says a couple of things. I wanted to quote him. He says that they are universal patterns of being. Um, 
humanity understands them as behavioral patterns, but they're actually universal patterns of being. He says on page 226 of um, the archetypes in the collective unconscious, just as all archetypes have a positive, favorable, bright side that points upward, so also they have one that points downward, partly negative, unfavorable, partly synthonic, but for the rest, merely neutral. So the archetype is neither good nor bad. It contains both. There's even a neutral aspect to the archetype where it won't take sides. Not always, but that is part of the form of the archetype. <clears throat> so the archetype is the original pattern of being on this planet. So we'll start with that idea that the archetype is the original part of being on this planet. So it has formed us into and moves us, directs us. It is the producer, it is the director, it is the money, it is behind the camera, it is the camera, and it's the actors. <laughs> so I'm going to start with that idea. Christy, what about you? Do you want to start with that? Uh, yeah, so I'll start with what I notice. My when I hear, I will hear the archetypes through language. So for example, um, someone telling me about a story and I notice people will language archetypes quite easily. They will say, he's such a victim, she's a victim. I heard that probably more often and or they're acting like a child and um, what I'm listening for are key sentences within the architecture of the archetype to see where they're at and what pattern they are identifying with. So we can, and that's where light and shadow come in for me is, are they in the shadow of the archetype, which is also neutral, that they are not seen. And I think it's difficult to, if you haven't ever heard of archetypes, it's difficult to identify them. And sometimes for me, language is the most, is the beginning place to identify what an archetype, how it shows up. And I also hear people will identify archetypes like they will also say, um, she's a warrior, he's a warrior, we have victim, we have, um, child some of the main ones and even saboteur is a is a major archetype that these are the most common ones that i hear and so what i am excited about dr lahav is hearing a perspective of how can we better step out of those core survival archetypes into more of a a neutral pattern that um is more empowering versus disempowering? That's a good question, Christy. I want to, so um, let's talk about, I'm gonna, I have some notes that I wanted to talk about. An archetype is a universal image. And what does that mean? That means the character, the story, the symbol, the situation or pattern that reoccurs through literature and thought consistently enough to be considered a repetitive concept or situation, which means that it's cross-cultural, it's, it's cross-continental, it's, um, it's across um, different species on this planet. It's across everything that we do in terms of the way that we move in the world. And how Jung understood this is that there couldn't have been that much cross-cultural exchange to the point where people were dreaming of the same patterns, that they would see the same things, 
that when they tell similar stories, I think one of the stories that we tell on the individuation podcast is um, Archetypal Symbols and Fairy Tales by Mary Louise von Franz, which today we went through. Um, but in that, we talk about the idea of what it is to have a pattern in the world. And Christie's talking about the negative aspects of the archetypal patterns. So there are negative aspects of the archetypal patterns because the archetypal patterns take on the variety that is the, um, that covers, that colors humanity. There are different patterns and different ways of thinking of the patterns. Um, as we look at archetypal patterns, the, characteris the characteristics of the archetypes, one of them is shared with all humanity, does not belong to a person or particular culture or state or country. So you can have that pattern, you could have archetypal warriors in a small country, you could have archetypal warriors in a large country, you could have it in an industrialized state, you could have it in a state that's developing, you could have it in a state that has had thousands of years of civilization, you could have it on new states that just arose from larger land states that had, for example, the former Soviet Union that broke up into several small countries that before were their own independent cultures. So you have these patterns. Christy, what, what thoughts come to mind? Mm. I think you're doing a wonderful job of explaining what the archetype is. And then also, the, I think one of the most important ones is that it's neutral. Um, it's easy, and I speak for myself as well, to attach to, to it more personally. And that could just be, I don't know if that comes from the ego mind of identification with it versus seeing it as a pattern, not as part of my personality. Does well, that make sense? It's part of your personality. Is it? Absolutely. I think, I think it influences the personality a great deal. Because it, it, it represents um, different aspects of likes and dislikes within the personality. So there's a lot of likes and dislikes that magicians have. There are likes that an archetypal magician uh, likes solitude, likes to um, be alone in their thoughts, likes to reflect on the world, likes to dislikes to interact with large groups of people uh, for entertainment, uh, dislikes the idea of not listening to the whole conversation, dislikes the idea that if it's a shallow conversation, they're going to check out at the beginning of the conversation. So some of those things, I think, are they influence our personalities. Now, how they influence our personalities is that you're probably a lot more diplomatic than I am at times. And I think that's also a male, female kind of component mm. um, in the archetypal structure. Um, so I think there, there are like variations in, in the way it influences us, but it does influence us in the same direction when we see each other. Okay, that's helpful. And how, how would we know what archetype that we are do we have one do we have many well so Jung's idea of how uh, he drew the psyche the psyche would have different uh, archetypes that he called uh, complexes so I think what the way we think about the archetypal patterns and the complexes is that there are there are archetypal patterns that are much more uh, encompassing. Uh, there are complexes that are formed from arch uh, their archetypal energy. Complexes are archetypes. They're just um, 
their influence is more localized to, um, to the individual person, where the larger archetypal pattern is the movement of that person, where there's small mechanisms within the engine that make it sound or feel a certain way. The archetypal pattern of the magician or of the lover or of the warrior or of the queen is the whole machine that makes it run. So what you have is you have all these different parts the machine cannot run without. Mm. But the machine itself runs on this very large archetypal pattern. And it's that archetypal pattern that um, creates the narrative for the machine. It okay. creates the story of where, why, when, how I want you to go into the world. That's one of the key pieces to understanding the archetypes. Yes. So the, the, the anima, which is an important um, archetypal pattern, is connected to both um, the anima and the animus. Personally, I think that Jung separated them, but they're not separate. Mm -hmm. I think they exist within each archetypal pattern. I think you have a very strong and feminine and masculine scale. And I think it tips in different directions, depending on what is needed. I would agree but with that. I don't think it is the way we think of feminine and masculine. I think that's been bastardized. That's, that story has been more the, the culture, the patriarchy, the, the dominant culture has diced and miced these pieces into separate pieces. They're not separate pieces. They uh -huh. flow in and out of each other. They are internally connected through time, through the archetypal pattern. You cannot cut them up into pieces. I agree. Um, just a, a side note in my perception of masculine feminine. Yes. Um, when I'm, for me, the body shows the right side. This is the right side represents more of masculine energy, which is doing, making decisions, um, <clears throat> getting things done. That masculine, which we all do have, because that's part of taking a step into the world and the left side of the body represents the feminine also representing the past. So when I'm looking at someone's structure, I am looking at the balance of <clears throat> the balance of masculine feminine within the tissue structure of the body, which also tells me the patterns of the archetypes. If we were speaking that language and how that person is showing up in the world. Are they showing up with more, um, are they more inhibited in, in that taking action and stepping out into the world? And that person may have much more pain on the right side of the body and the left side, if they tend to feel more emotional, they're more heart centered, they can have pain in the left side of the body. So the masculine and feminine for me always exist and move within each other. I, I would agree to that. I, I think that the, the way the um, the way I think of it is balance. Yeah. And I think when the balance is off, um, the feminine masculine balance is off within internal what uh, Jung would call the anima and the animus. When that balance is off, the balance throws you. And therefore, you have these problems, I think, what you're describing as a physical result of being thrown. It's like being thrown from a horse. You get thrown from the archetypal energy. There's a part is like understanding the archetype is understanding the energy. It's mm -hmm. understanding what the energy is doing. Right? The energy has no form. We are the form. Yes. So that's the first thing we need to know. The energy has no form, at least not to our naked eye. We are still trying to see it for what it is. And the more microscopes 
we create, the more telescopes we create, the more we wonder what we're looking at. We get more and more confused. Yep. Because our small human brain is trying to absorb this idea that I am made up of parts that I can't see, I can't touch, I can't hear, I can't smell, I can't taste. Although they influence every aspect of your existence. They are the pieces that put everything into play. So for, for example, to use a, um, a modern example, if you watch the Mission Impossible series, the four archetypes always show up. You always have the lover, you always have the magician, you always have the king, and you always have a warrior. Now, as the series has gone on, I think at eight or nine, I don't know how many movies they made, <clears throat> those parts are changing now. At the beginning, the lover was always female. Now the warrior is female. Now there is um, a queen who is um, a female who is queen. It's no longer only the king showing up. So you have this diverse uh, change of the feminine masculine aspect, but the archetypes always show up together. Mm -hmm. There's this great scene and Mission Impossible where the four are sitting across from each other. They're having conversation. And this is where you can see how the archetype moves in the world. And it's, it's a conversation about they're breaking into Langley to steal a supercomputer that has a knock list, which basically every agent across the world, but to get there, there's this problem. Anyway, through the conversation, so the magician and lover are sitting next to each other. The warrior and the king are sitting next to each other. The king is facing the magician, which is Tom Cruise. Vin Raines is the king, right? And then you have the lover and then you have the warrior. They're facing each other. So even the way they sit at the archetypal table, they face their opposite. They face their counterpart. This is purely unconscious. This is, a, this is like through what Jung talks about as the collective unconscious. Mm. This, is the connect, this is the thing that connects us all to creation. That's what the collective unconscious is. For our purposes, for what Jung believed is that this is our connection to everything. This is our connection to the source. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the term source for um, the beginning. And it's also the end. It's the same source. It's the archetypal energy that when the Big Bang occurred, started to rush through the world and created everything through the cosmos, created the planets, the stars, the moons, the wormholes, the grass, the trees, the people, the animals, the insects, everything. And therefore, it is the beginning, it's the end. It is what moves everything forward. But it also extends through time. It is the beginning. Hmm. That's the part, yeah. That's the part that I think we're learning more and more in science is that so much of that we don't understand. Correct. And the more we think we find out, the more confused we become. Yes. When we hypothesize there's dark matter and suddenly dark matter shows up. Okay, where did it come from? How did we know there was dark matter? It was already created. Because, yes, because yeah. the archetypal energy is already there. It exists in different forms. It exists in different spaces. It exists in different realities. And use the term reality is like a corridor of doors. 
where you go into this large place and you see a bunch of doors. And each door that you open takes you on a different trip. So is that is that why it's important to understand your own architecture within the archetypes? Yes. Because what does that do for us when we better understand the patterns of the archetypes? What does that do for me as a human being? Well, that's a, that's a great question. That's a great question because a part of, part of the question that um, helps us is that we understand what the archetypal pattern is trying to do, right? As a human being, why, why is that important? Why is it showing up? Why does it keep repeating itself in the world? Why right. does it keep coming out and say, hey, look at me, I'm right here. I'm sitting in front of you. Can you see me? Can you see me? Okay, so the pattern exists from birth. It connects us to our true origin, our true form, the source of all beginning. So when you see a child and you talk to a child, what you sense is that the child comes from that womb. They are still very much connected to the archetypal patterns. They will pick up the mud. They will create with their hands. Mm. They will touch their face. They will touch their bodies. They usually don't like to wear clothes. They'll run around naked screaming. They are in touch because they are still connected to the beginning. And the further they move away from the beginning, and they become, they put on clothes, they become more civilized, they start eating with a fork, they're not spitting out their food. <laughs> they further, they get further away from the archetypal origin. And the further you get from the archetypal origin, the further you get lost. Mm. And that's when you start searching for what? Meaning. Right. When do you start searching for meaning? Is when you are further away from the origin. Yeah. You're no longer able to recognize where it started. You're no longer able to connect to that. That, that's why we call the child archetype. There's a child archetype because the child archetype is the origin. And, and with that, Dr. Lahab, my obvious question is, okay, how do I get back to that? So the same way out is not the same way in. It's never the same door. Because the door you entered from is the door of all knowing. Mm. The door you're trying to get back to is the door of all knowing. That door doesn't exist anymore. You came out of that door. So now you have to find the door back. That's the tricky part. How do you find the door back? The door back is, the, is to let go of what you think you're holding on to. That's the first aspect. You have to let go of whatever you're holding on to. So if it's pain, you have to let go of it. You can't reach the archetypal pattern when you're in pain or you're in trauma. It keeps you away. So if you're pain in the physical self, that holds you, that drags you away from becoming more um, embodied. We'll use the term embodied a lot, so I should define it. But to be more in the energetic pattern, to be more part of the energetic pattern, to move with the archetypal energy than to move against it. We hurt ourselves by moving against it. I don't want to do that. I know I have to, but I'm, I'm not going to. Okay, you have free will. But that doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. Because what you're moving against is your own pattern, your own energy, your own way in the world. And when we move against that, that's when we get in trouble. 
So when there's this resistance within us um, and we're aware that we want to move through a different door and I'm just going to layer this a little bit and we come from a situation where there's been some type of trauma in childhood or adulthood, how, how do we open or clear some of that so we're even aware there's a door? Well, so treatment is required to remove the trauma. To remove the trauma is to go through the trauma. To go through the trauma, you have to be, your, um, your system has to be able to be, uh, remain calm enough to go through the trauma, mm. right? So if we are traumatized to work through the trauma, this is why we use Young and Advanced Motor Processing, JAMP, it, the parasympathetic is calm enough where we are not in intense, hyper alert paranoia and pain. So we are able to go through that doorway, Christy, and remove those pieces that are keeping us from the archetypal energy because the complex is formed. How is the complex formed? The complex is formed through the trauma. Mm. What happens is, is the archetypal energy covers the traumatic disassociated aspects and says, here you go. I'm going to save you from all this. You don't have to look at it. It's too much for you. But by the way, one day you're going to have to resolve this. You can't leave it like this. Okay, okay, but not now, right? Okay. Okay, fair enough, not now. Because I remember telling myself as like a young adult, yeah, you know, I'll deal with that after I get out of school. I'll deal with that after I've done this. I'll deal with that because I didn't want to deal with it. Right. But not dealing with it creates this larger problem because it's demanding to be heard and you're basically saying, I don't want to hear you. Yes. I pretend not to hear you. I disassociate from that which you are irritating me with. And the reason it needs to be heard is because the reason is that the nature of the energy needs to be integrated. We as beings need to be integrated, which means that this, the, the parts of us that are unconscious to us that are causing the most havoc have to be part of consciousness so they don't cause so much havoc. And when something is disassociated, it's not in consciousness. And when it's not in consciousness, it's pushing my buttons, but I don't know what the hell it is. I don't know why I'm so angry with people. Well, that's probably because of the trauma. I don't know why I cry so much. That's probably because of the trauma. I don't know why my body hurts so much. I don't know why my left leg hurts so much. Well, that's probably because of the trauma. I don't know why my face looks like this all the time. I always look angry. That's probably because of the trauma. And so to get to the trauma, we have to go through the trauma. And I was explaining to one of my students about getting through the trauma. So what I said was, I said, once you start going through the trauma, you can't look back. So once you start doing the treatment, you go forward in the story. You never go backwards in the story. And she said something really brilliant. She said, she goes, oh, it's like Persephone and walking out of Hades. You can't yeah. look back. I said, yes, because you get stuck. Yeah. And that's exactly right. That's what happens. You get stuck in Hades. You get stuck in the underworld because you get enamored by all the shiny objects. Oh, look. You have pain here. Oh, look, there's stuff going on over there. And so I'm lost now. I don't know where I am because what the treatment what, when you are working with trauma is it resonates at a certain level. And we've all had trauma. And therefore, that resonance connects to ours, mm. even though we've had a very different trauma. And therefore, we get hooked by it. 
And the start, story gets told again and again. We start to look at it like, wow, you know, I was feeling that way. That mm -hmm. happened with my mom. Not exactly the way it did with yours. And suddenly now the person who is treating the trauma is having their own recollection of their own. And so you're lost. You're lost in the underworld. You're lost within the psyche. And this yeah. is what happens with trauma is like what happens is we get stuck. And when we get stuck, we can't move forward. And therefore, you're basically trapped in this hall, this um, castle of doors. You open one door and you find something. You open another door, you find something else. But you don't know which way is out. Yeah. And I think some of the key phrases that you used um, is I feel trapped. Ooh. I feel blocked. Ooh. I don't know which way to go. Ooh. To me, when I hear someone say that, it is an indication that they're ready to actually see a door. Ooh. Because it takes awareness to actually know you're trapped. Um, and I think when, when we come to that point, whatever movement in the unconscious is scooting us forward on some level I and do, other doors open to find people like you to find people like me that helps us um, maybe be a guide through the door Ooh. but I think yeah. the awareness to know we're stuck is is the beginning point of the maze Oh, I agree. I, I think the, uh, the awareness, I think you stated it very well. I think when you uh, start to hear yourself say those things and start to know that you're saying them. Yes. Is, um, it's the awareness of that you're making those statements. Once you are aware, then that means that time is up. You have to deal with it. Yes. You cannot procrastinate anymore. Because if it's gotten to that point, that means you are ready to move forward. And if you're not ready to move forward, as Carl Jung famously said, your destiny can, you could walk willingly with it, or you could be drag kicking and screaming. Destiny will get its way. Destiny is an archetype, by the way. Mm. Destiny will drag you in that path because that's where you're supposed to go. That's how it goes. And the archetypal patterns work in unison, even though they conflict with each other. The part of the conflict is that they exist together. The neutrality that occurs is usually that the patterns don't take up arms against each other. Only the forms do because they misinterpret mm. the energetic patterns. So you start hunting magicians and killing them off because you fear that they know something you don't. That's just the archetypal energy. So you're trying to kill off the energy, but the energy as we know from the first law of thermodynamics is never created nor destroyed. So um, these patterns exist from birth. They connect us to our true origin, our true form, the source of all beginnings. Archetypes cannot directly be knowable, but they express themselves in the drama of form. You can't see the archetype unless you know it's, it's a... Uh, caricature of the archetype, mm. which is uh, which is like uh, the 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 suits of um, metal that the knights wore, or the exaggerated uh, clothing of a magician, or the exaggeration of what the lover is, or the exaggeration of uh, something like. Um, the Queen of England sitting on her throne in all her regalia, not just like in dress, but like the whole thing, like the headgear, the robe, the scepter, 
that then you could look and say, oh, there is the archetype, but you can't see it in the world. What you can see is the drama that unfolds. That's what you can see. That's what you can see in Mission Impossible is the drama that unfolds between the four, how they work together, how they betray each other, how they recognize each other, how they question and are suspicious of each other, and how this drama unfolds, how they work together or how they don't work, how they work against each other. The drama unfolds. And it's that drama that keeps pulling us back. This is where, this is why we have to keep watching that story. But it's the same tagline, it's the same person. Yeah, I wanna know what happens next. Well, we already know what happens next. That's kind of like the, um, the giveaway. I don't wanna give you the rest of the details of the movie, but you've already seen it anyway. It's the same movie. Many times. So they also illuminate the human understanding of the sciences, of psychology, of biology, of chemistry, of physics. They are the driving force. As much as the archetypal patterns are unconscious, we think of them, they're gods, they're immortal. They've existed since the beginning of time. But they can't see themselves. This is why they need a form. The form is what recognizes them. And the form is us. We are the form. Yes. And so if that piece of, you said they are the gods that that would indicate that we have that element of God within us. Of course, we are, we are their creation. Yeah. Connected. We are them, they are us. And that's why we have so many problems. Because we have people who suddenly think of themselves as gods. Because, oh, I have more. But say things like, I have more money than God. They say things like that unconsciously. Yeah. They say it all the time. You know. I have more PhDs than God. I have this more than God. I have that more. Well, okay, who's saying that? That would be the archetype. Exactly. So the archetypal energy is saying it. The problem is the form is believing it. It's when the form starts to believe that kind of talk is when things get skewed. They go sideways. They go sideways because you are not what you think you are, but you're also not what you believe you are. And that's always kind of the connection to it. So therefore, the better you feel about yourself, the less trauma you have, or the more that you've treated the different aspects of pain, irritation, anxiety, All obsessive behaviors, fear, the more you treat it, the more you feel you're within yourself. The more you're within yourself, the more you can be with the energy instead of going against the energy, which means you go against self. Um, I see that as well in energetic weight in people's fields um it it shows up as a as density like um even being around someone that i would say is highly conflicted or is having a lot of issues you can feel when you walk in a room well we'll speak it oh there's something going on we can we can feel that density within someone's field which creates the blocks of becoming more whole and embodying the energies of the archetypes. Yeah. And so what I'm hearing you say is, as we clear the trauma, actually become aware and observe our trauma, 
whatever that is, as we begin to clear that, that's when the magic happens of the embodiment and of less resistance stepping into destiny, whatever that is for us. That's the door you're asking about. Yeah. That's how you find the door. Yeah. You asked earlier, how do you find the door? Where is the door? How can we find this door? The door is through treatment. The door is through feeling okay about yourself. The trauma is gone. Whoever caused the trauma is gone. They're physically gone from you. The problem that stays with you is the disassociated aspects of what happened to you. This fragmented story that you have created meaning for is now caged you and is now torturing you because you've created something to contain these feelings and these thoughts. And so you basically created your own monster. So when the trauma starts and the trauma hits you, when the trauma is what you experienced, it becomes digested. And once it's digested, it becomes a problem. Yeah. Because there's so many aspects of it that are splintered off. And therefore, I can't pull the whole picture to see the picture to be able to file it away in my memory banks. I don't have the picture. I see flashes of pictures. I see flashes of images. I see flashes of feeling. What happens in the trauma is that when we disassociate, we also disassociate the feeling. So Jung calls it a feeling tone complex. What that is, is that the feeling connects to an energetic piece and is disassociated. So fear is disassociated. Despair is disassociated. Sadness is disassociated. For example, within the trauma. And so what you have is like a feeling of fear around an energy. So suddenly out of nowhere, you're sitting in your chair, staring at something and you start feeling fear or dread or despair. Oh, I don't feel good. Well, that's not you. That's the feeling tone of the dissociated parts of the trauma. They're getting your attention. Hey, we're stuck down here. Are you going to do something about this? Hmm. Because we, we don't know what to do with it. We're just going to keep pushing your buttons until you do something about it. So that's when we start to realize that I don't need to live this way. We use terms like, I don't want to, I don't want to exist this way anymore. I want to do something different. I want to feel better, right? You have people who come to you and say, Christy, I want to feel better. I don't want to feel these feelings anymore. Yeah. And, or I, I would like to feel. Yeah. That's the other aspect, right? Yeah. The other aspect is to be numb. Yes. Because I've been hurt so much that feel of having a feeling state is dangerous for me because all I've experienced is pain. And so I dissociate myself from my feeling state. So I am split and I'm dissociated. So I have two states. One is of experiencing nothing mm -hmm. and the other is of experiencing pain. And I like to stay away from the pain. I'd rather be in limbo, but limbo is a problem. Yeah, limbo is its own cage. Exactly. It just creates a different, it creates a different problem, but it's still, you're not moving. You're still stuck. Yeah. And so, Dr. Lahab, is there a, 
So you've given us a lot of amazing information about the complex and the archetypes Ooh. and trauma. Is there uh, one one thing that we could um, notice about about ourselves that maybe could take a step help us take a step forward in uh, observing where we're at within within the archetypes? Yeah, I mean, if if we if we are not going against our intuition, okay. If we don't trust ourselves, then we're moving against ourselves, which means that we're moving against our energy, which means we're moving against our patterns that bring us more joy, more creation, more freedom. We're moving in the opposite direction. So can you give an example of that? Yeah, so somebody who's somebody who is traumatized or um, by, for instance, their mother. Mother did something when they were younger that really hurt, their, hurt them in ways that they don't understand. So, and a friend comes by and they're, you know, hanging out and they're having a good time. So they're talking, they're laughing and he goes, um, by the way, how's your mother? Oh, you had to go and say her name. Why would you do that to me? So suddenly I'm triggered. And what happens is, is that once you are triggered, you know, so everybody knows they have triggers. Yeah. And they're terrified that people are going to press them. The problem is if you have triggers, nobody knows where the hell they are. No, they do it's, not. They just it's show not, up. They're, they're just, they're just going to talk the way they talk. And sooner or later, they're going to by accident. It doesn't matter because you have triggers. Sooner or later, I'm going to hit one of those. <laughs> I'm just going to hit one of those because what is it? Is because the mother complex is related to so many things. It's related to growing up. It's related to caring. It's related to food. It's related to love. It's related to connection. It's related to intimacy. It's related to feeling safe. It's related, it's related, it's related. So sooner or later, I'm going to trigger you. I don't have to go and say, how's your mother? <laughs> That's a direct trigger. That's Maybe I know that you have a terrible relationship with your mother. You wouldn't or, know that. Or maybe I just criticize the way you're cooking. Yeah. Maybe I just say, oh, it needs more salt. Oh, now you sound like my mother. Yeah. <laughs> so suddenly I'm triggered again because of salt. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what it is. The triggers are all there. And therefore, you need treatment for those. If you do not get the treatment, and this is where jam comes in. When you get the treatment, we take the triggers off the table. They're no longer on the table because now the dissociative pieces of the trauma, the feeling tone complexes are not sitting there ready to draw on that energy. So what happens is, is that you get triggered, you start feeling like you're in that cycle. Right. So what happens is you get energized. So the first thing that happens is you're triggered. Salt. The next thing that happens is you get energized. How do you get energized? Well, you're standing next to me in the kitchen. I'm like, why don't you cook? Which would be another trigger. Why don't you put salt in it? Since you know better than I do, why don't you take this? And suddenly now I'm getting more and more irritated. I'm drawing more and more energy of no longer is my mother away from me. My mother is in you. And uh, now yeah. I want to kill you. So I get through this and then we have an argument. It's like, oh shit, I thought you invited me for dinner. I didn't know salt was going to set you off. I'm leaving. And then you're like, on the next day, you know, you're on the phone going, hey, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry, I overreacted. It's just, you know, this thing about my mother, it always, you know, kind of gets me. And so you end up apologizing. And then what happens is eventually you don't want to invite people over for dinner. 
because you're going to avoid that activity, even though you love to cook. You're going to avoid that activity so not to get triggered. The problem is, is that every time you take something off the table, then you have nothing left on the table. Then you're just stuck. Well, if I don't invite people over for dinner because I'm afraid of being triggered, um, I don't have all the guests that I used to have and I enjoy their company because I like talking about food and making food for them. And I don't, I don't like to eat with them because they might criticize my cooking. So, <laughs> so what happens is, is that eventually, slowly but surely, you isolate yourself. Yeah. Because you're afraid of something happening that you would have to apologize for. But there's no need to apologize. You just need to go to treatment because then you don't feel like you're stuck anymore. It's the feeling of being stuck and not being able to do anything. And so when the complex is triggered, the archetypal energy gets charged up. And suddenly you feel like, you know, you're this harrowing person with, a, with an ax and you want to chop everybody up around you to feel better. Yeah. It takes over. Completely. That's a very good example that I'm sure most of us can relate to. Well, it happens to us a lot, right? Yeah. It happens to us. I, I think um, even for those who are not traumatized, you can still get triggered, but it doesn't have to be negative. The, the part of it is when it overtakes you and it's controlling you, and then it's terrorizing you, that's when it's a problem. Because that means that your tolerance for your, your trauma, we, call it, we, we talk about the complex, has become the single most salient fact of your existence. It's the thing that keeps you under its foot. Yeah. It doesn't let you go. And literally, that is a, such a good example of what I experience in my practice is people in that state feeling trapped physically. Because that's what I really would like people to understand is it, are these patterns that we're talking about are um, so real when we avoid them for a long time. That is what's showing up in the body. That's what's showing up as like, for example, the tightness in the throat or um, hip pain, it's resisting looking at what is keeping us stuck. Chest pain, not being able to speak, clearing your throat all the time. I think you gave that. That's a really good example of yeah. clearing one's throat, like because I'm having a hard time saying what I'm feeling. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm not talking about like a chest infection. I'm just talking about like, I need to, before I say something, I need to clear my throat because there's a part of me that's not been allowed to state my truth. Yeah. And therefore that's what I struggle with every time I try to, and that's part of the trauma. That's part of being hurt. That's part of being hurt in early childhood. Because other people told you what you could and could not do or say what you say or do things that you cannot say or do. They, they insist upon putting rules and regulations on you, which is mistreatment anyway, but that hurt you. And that those feelings is like, oh, you know, my parents never did anything wrong but they weren't nice. Well, yeah. that's what's wrong. I mean, it seems simple enough, but a lot of people miss it. That's the problem. Well, I think that's the paradox, Dr. Lahab, is it seems simple mm. and it isn't because no. you, you're going to have to bring that up and consciously feel what that was before it can move. Yes. Correct. Yes, which I've, absolutely. I've heard you call it <coughs> conscious suffering. Yes. Where you're conscious, you're observing, you're allowing it to come up, you're giving it space so it can move. 
Yes. And not reminisce in it. And then also you uh, spoke about not looking back once it is gone. Yes, not bathing in the pain. Yeah. I mean, we don't need to bathe in the pain anymore. No. And once we, once we are out of that tub, we do not need to go back into it. Yeah. We absolutely do not. And that, that's a matter of choice. Is a, a, some people want to go back into the tub because they, they believe that that's their value. My value is in suffering. Right. The, 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 but the, there's a problem with that statement. There are many problems with that statement, but there is a major problem with that statement. You have no value when you're suffering. You're just decaying and hurting. You cannot connect to anything that gives you that feeling of value. That connection to other people, to other things, to doing stuff, to getting out, to interacting, to being with the world, I think, is about feeling connected, which we feel valued when we're connected. When we're disconnected, we don't feel value. We, we are social animals. We like other people. We like to connect. <coughs> Excuse me. We like to feel listened to. We like to feel heard. Uh, we like to be loved. We want other people to check in on us, check up on us, see us. And that's difficult. That's difficult when we are scared. Yeah. of being triggered and i think that's a huge point especially after the pandemic uh, christy um that we're still in that yeah. some people want to run away from um we have to face these stories we have to face these realities if we do not face these realities if we do not if we do not talk about these stories if we do not face these stories we're not going to move forward no and um coming out of, and I've heard this with many clients as well, the last year and a half being being contained in their houses has created a whole different, this is probably a different podcast, but a whole other issue about wanting to actually physically go out again. Yeah. And, and so the conversation to speak about <clears throat> that in and of itself of that experience in the pandemic is um would be a good conversation to have in the future yeah well we'll we'll add it to the list of things that we're going to talk about in our upcoming episodes so i think this is a good point to kind of leave people um until our next episode yeah i think so too I think we learned a lot from you. Thank you. And I, I think that you you have you give um, you give the body a voice that needs to be heard. I mm -hmm. think that's a very important voice. That the form has a voice. That it has meaning, and how the form reacts because these are intertwined. Yeah, we are both energy and within a form and the form has a memory, has a feeling state that needs to be taken into consideration. And so when Destiny Calls, we'll be back next week. I am Dr. Lahab Al Samurai. This is Christy Foster. And we are When Destiny Calls, our new podcast was part of the, Young, uh, the JAM Training Institute. Uh, we'd like you to learn more about us. We're happy to share um, our ideas about treatment and what they uh, pertain to. And um, treatment is actually not a complicated activity that can be done remotely uh, from your home anywhere in the world. So you just need a computer and headphones, but treatment can be done with um, Young Advanced Motor Processing. And um, Christy is one of my students who will be um, doing Young Advanced Motor Processing. 
uh, very soon. And we look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you. Christy, you have anything to add? Yeah, I just want to add for people as you start to listen to the podcast uh, to pay attention and observe your patterns. So if you have questions, you can ask questions and we can answer them on the podcast. Sounds good. We'd love your questions and your input. And we will be back next week. This is the Jam Training Institute's One Destiny Calls with Christy Foster. See you next week. Thank you.